Thank you for joining us for the rebroadcast of the worship service from the chapel at Ocean Reef. This past Sunday, it was the last Sunday of 2023. Our text this morning, it's a very familiar passage from the Christmas story. It's the story of the wise men. But maybe there are some things that uh, you'll find surprising about who they were and why they came. So let's join the worship service now. Well, this is the Sunday that the church typically celebrates the uh, coming of the wise men to Bethlehem. Uh, somebody said that if there had been three wise women instead of three wise men, they would first have asked for directions. They would have arrived on time. They would have delivered the baby, cleaned the stable, made a casserole, and probably brought peace on earth. <laughs> There's some measure of good sense to that, I think. But like a lot of speculative ideas, we'll just never know. But much of our understanding of the appearance of the wise men at the birth of Jesus, I want to say this morning, it's been far more informed by Hallmark Christmas cards than it has been by the gospel story itself. Now, what do I mean? Oh, okay, bye. He'll be, for, and, and by the way, if kids act up during church, first of all, don't react to them. It's music, isn't it? And moms and dads, it, yeah, and, yeah, and, and, uh, and if they get really noisy, mom and dad, there's a room out there where you can go with them. And, you know, the people around you will be thankful, but it's, it's, we're just so glad the kids are here with us. So where was I? Okay. Uh, we're, we're not told how many wise men there were. How many typically do we think there were? Three of them. Why do we think that? Because they brought how many gifts? Three gifts. Tradition tells us that they had names, Casper, Melchior, and Balthazar. Uh, the other thing that we are not told is precisely when they arrived following the birth of Jesus. Uh, how, when they made their way to Bethlehem. Friends, it could have been days, could have even been several weeks. But here's the one thing that you and I can know with certainty. It's this, that visit took place and it is absolutely filled with significance. Would you listen as I read the text of Matthew 2, our scripture this morning? Friends, hear the word of God, the gospel of Christ. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Bethlehem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. Well, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judah, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Well, then Herod called the Magi secretly, and he found out from them the event, the, time, the exact time the star appeared, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Well, after they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen went, when it rose went ahead of them, and it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures 
And they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up. He took the child and the mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders, listen, kill all of the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years of age and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Well, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went back to the land of Israel but when he heard Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go to Jerusalem. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. Friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For those of you who are visiting, there's a prayer that I've led us praying so many times through the years. It's a children's prayer. You know it probably from the musical Godspell. These are the words we're going to pray. Lord, help us see you more clearly in order that we can love you more dearly and follow you more nearly day by day. Would you join me as we pray that together? Lord, help us see you more clearly in order that we can love you more dearly and follow you more nearly day by day in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to try and hang a frame around this text that we've read this morning. And I, I want to invite you to consider it as a kind of literary triptych. Uh, a triptych is a, a painting, three panels, and we're going to divide this text into three portions, if you would. We're going to call the first part mystery. We'll call the middle part mayhem. And we'll call the third part majesty. Mystery, mayhem, and majesty. Now, if, if you want to unravel a mystery, what do you have to do? You need to ask questions, don't you? A lot of us learned in grammar school there are some important questions to ask. We're going to draw on three of them this morning. Who, why, and what? Say, Bob, those are really good questions, aren't they? Good, thank you very much. Okay, who were, who were these men, wise men? Who were the Magi? Well, they were certainly scholars of the stars, as one person puts it. They were astronomers. They were astrologers. They likely came from Persia, the area today that you and I, if you look at a map, it's in far eastern Iraq or far western Iran, down where the two rivers gather. Uh, for them, assuming they left from the ancient city of Susa, it would mean a journey of at least a thousand miles. There was no net jets to call for a flight. There was no Uber that would take you there. There was one and only one way to get there that was riding on the back of a camel. I hope it was two humps so you would have some place to rest your back. 
Well, they made the trip up and around the Fertile Crescent and into Israel much in the same way Father Abraham had made the journey centuries before when God called him from his home in Ur. And this journey was going to take weeks to complete. Now, most scholars agree on who they were. But the question that I find often unasked is this one. Why on earth did they come? Uh, here's, here's the questions that have come to my mind. Why would these star scholars, these astrologers and astronomers from the east a thousand miles away, why would they even care who was being born king of the Jews? I mean, why, why would they have any reason at all to care about anything having to do with the Jewish people? Have you ever wondered that? Any of you? Oh, Lord, I'm all by myself, I guess, in that question. Why on earth would they travel extravagant distances, bringing extraordinary gifts to pay homage to a Jewish baby who was born in a Roman province at the far end of the empire in a second-rate region that the Romans called Palestina? And I find myself wondering why on earth were they searching the heavens for a star that indicated the birth of the king of the Jews? Would you like me to give you my best answer? Good, thank you very much, because I'm going to. So here, here's my best shot at this, my best answer. I think the why, the answer, at least a clue to the why is this. Because of the lasting influence of two prophets, one from Israel a prophet by the name of Daniel, and a non-Jewish prophet from Persia, maybe you remember him, whose name was Balaam. Now, Daniel, let me tell you a little bit about him if you haven't read his story in a while. He was taken captive into Babylon when Nebuchadnezzar's army seized Jerusalem in 586 B.C. The, the, the Jewish people were taken captive Jerusalem was sacked and the temple destroyed. Well, when Daniel got there, he and three of his friends, if you read his book, they, they quickly rose to the levels of influential positions in the government because of their God-given abilities and wisdom. But there's one story in dramatic fashion where God revealed the content of a dream and the significance of a dream to Nebuchadnezzar, the ruler. Nebuchadnezzar would not tell him any, any of his wise men the content of the dream. He says, because you're all trying to suck up to me. And if I tell you the content of the dream, you're going to make up some interpretation. So unless you tell me the content of the dream and what it means, it's going to be off with your heads. Well, Daniel and his buddies happened to be around at that time, and he sheepishly went up and said, What's the big deal? Why is this happening? And uh, the, the, the guard told him, Nebuchadnezzar. And so Daniel, <laughs> he goes quickly to his three friends, and guess what he asked them to do? Pray! <laughs> like crazy. Guess what? God answered. He went back to Nebuchadnezzar's key guy, and he says, There is a God in heaven who reveals dreams. And it's not because I'm anything that I can tell you what this dream is. It's because God has revealed it, and he wants you, King Nebuchadnezzar, to know what's coming. Listen to part of his vision. Here's what he says. There before him, Daniel, was one like a son of man. Have you ever heard that title before? Just a time or two. He was coming with the clouds of heaven. The Son of Man approached the Ancient of Days, God the Father, and He was led into His presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power, and peoples of every language worshipped Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed Perhaps they also recalled the words of the Persian prophet Balaam. He'd lived near the Euphrates River. 
in a fourth of a series of prophecies that God had given him, listen to what he said. He said, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. And then he says this, a star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel and a ruler will come out of Jacob. My best shot at the why is this. I think generations of Magi searched the heavens for centuries, waiting for the star that would arise out of Jacob and over Israel. They knew that that star would indicate the advent of the Son of Man, this King of the Jews, whose reign will be universal and everlasting. They determined to be part of the worship due him when he came, and they would bring gifts worthy of a king. The significance of Daniel's life was the impact of his words that lasted through generations. And when that long-awaited star appeared, they began the journey following wherever it would lead them. Now, second question, what? You say, I hope the next two don't take quite as long. They probably will. What is interesting is this. These outsiders, these non-Jewish star scholars believed and they followed the star that God had revealed. The insiders, the mainstream of the Jewish, listen carefully, religious leadership, they didn't pay any attention to it at all. These wise men thought the most sensible place to start their search for the king of the Jews would be where? In the city of the great king. What's that city called? You guys are very insecure in saying that. You were all afraid to be wrong as children in school, I can tell. Say the name with me. Jerusalem, right? So uh, they, they go there, and their arrival was going to lead to mayhem. Their question to Herod was honest and to the point. They wanted to know where is the one who has been born king of the Jews. We have seen his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Matthew tells us that when Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And friends, when Herod got disturbed, everybody got disturbed. Now, Caesar Augustus said something about Herod one time. He said, it is far better to be Herod's pig than his son. Want to know why he said that? It's a play on words in the Greek. It's because the word pig and the word son sound a lot alike. And it's because Herod killed three of his sons in order to keep his crown. When Herod gets disturbed, everybody gets disturbed. Turning to the religious leaders, Herod says, ask, where's the Messiah going to be born? This king is also the long-awaited Messiah. The religious leaders replied to Herod saying, hey, Bethlehem, the city of King David. And God had revealed that through the prophet Micah. Then in one, do you know when a politician is lying? Is it when their lips move? Yeah. In one of the greatest acts of hypocrisy in all of history, Herod asks the question. He asks and he says, uh, well, look, you, you go find him. And when you find him, you come and tell me so I can worship him too. What was the significance of their coming to Bethlehem? As we all recall from the story, the wise men were overjoyed when they found the child. Their joy in the child was because he was the one who fulfilled the visions of the prophets Daniel and Balaam. And his birth, they understood, meant the beginning of God's plan to bless all of the nations of the earth. His birth would be the beginning of the fulfillment of the promises that God made to Abraham 
that through Abraham's seed, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. They brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In an article in the Smithsonian Magazine, that magazine you always read when you're preparing to preach, there was a great article about gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And in fact, they said gold was the least valuable of the three gifts that were brought. The frankincense uh, was used to offer incense in the temple. It was an essential, expensive oil. And myrrh, it was an embalming spice. Their gifts, if you would, point us to the three roles or offices that will belong to the Messiah. He will be a king who will be a high priest for the sake of the nations, and he will offer his own life as a sacrifice, and he will, as we say in the confession, die and be buried. When Herod learned that the wise guys had returned by another route, that they'd tricked him, the mayhem began. Herod would be a hero to Hamas. He gave orders that every male child under two years of age be slaughtered. Bethlehem was a small village at the time, like some of those small kibbutzim along the Gaza border. There was no one in the town of Bethlehem who was untouched by the brutality of the actions that were carried out in their small village that day. Moms, dads, imagine. Every baby boy, Harrison, two years of age and under, ruthlessly and brutally murdered to protect the reign of a maniacal despotic ruler. That's part of the Christmas story. Can you learn anything from a guy like Herod? You want to know the answer? Yeah, we can. The big king resists the little king. Herod is a picture of how our human nature, yours and mine, tell the person next to you he's talking about you now. Come on, tell the person next to you he's talking about you now. Most of all, he's talking about himself, all right? He's a picture of how our human nature, yours and mine, how we react to Jesus' kingly claims over our lives and over the world that he created. Listen, we either passively resist him, or some of us got really good at actively rejecting him rebelling against him with we we want to rule our own lives we don't want god or anybody messing with how we live our lives let me say this only when you and i begin to see ourselves as the problematic people in the gospel only then do we begin to realize how good god's grace really is is. I'll never forget we came to the end of a presentation at First Presbyterian Church in Nashville many years ago. And this beautiful lady came walking up to me and she said, I, I really don't like what you said about sin this morning. I said, I don't, I don't like it either. <laughs> but it's the only thing that makes sense out of my life. It's the only thing that makes sense out of this crazy world. And oh, by the way, it's the only sense, it's the only thing that makes sense out of why Jesus died for you and for me. First thing to become part of God's family, you got to admit, is this. I'm not good enough. You know how church ought to start every Sunday? It won't, but it should. The preacher stands up in front and says, good morning, my name's Bob and I'm a sinner. And you know what you all say? Welcome, Bob. Glad you're here, right? Because we're all in recovery. There's no part of your life and mine that sin has not impacted in some way. Herod's, Herod lives on in human cry, kinds. This is from a dear friend. Exaggerated ambitions in our pretentiousness, our self-centeredness, 
our greed for power and position, in our grudge against God and, and in our guile. And there is a larger sobering truth to be remembered. Listen carefully. When God is resisted by people in power, be they religious leaders, be they church leaders, be they legitimately elected political leaders or despots, when God is resisted, humanity is threatened. Would you say that with me? When God is resisted, humanity is threatened. If you understand that, that should give you grave concern for our moment in time, both in our nation and in our world today. That's point two. Are you glad I'm getting to the third point now? We're getting to the good point. This is called majesty. Listen to what John wrote in the opening of his gospel. He said, nobody's ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, he has made him known. The majesty of Jesus is this. It's the mystery of the incarnation. His name is Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. And the one who is with us, according to John, the one who is with us is the very one whom none can look upon because our space-time conditioned human minds can no more fully comprehend the spaceless, timeless reality of the one true God than a blind person can comprehend light. God became one and took up his dwelling with us. Coming out of Egypt as Moses had led Israel out of Egypt, following their enslavement, Emmanuel came and lived in Nazareth. And Emmanuel's humility is astounding. Nazareth was a, a little place of so little importance that when the historian Josephus, when he made a list of all of the towns and villages in Galilee, guess which town never made the list? Nazareth. It was kind of like a little town not far from where I grew up, Bug Tussle, Texas. It would not have made the list. There really is a town bug tussle. How did Emmanuel grow up? Friends, he grew up learning a trade at the side of his earthly father. And in doing so, he sanctified the dignity of human labor and work. Emmanuel grew up being nurtured in the life and faith of the Jewish people. And he sanctified as Emmanuel for all time the privilege of of worshiping God in humility and gratitude. Emmanuel grew up living in a home with siblings and parents, one from the earth, the other from heaven, and he sanctified for all time the importance of a human family as we celebrated this morning in Harrison's baptism. Emmanuel submitted to the baptism of repentance under John the Baptist, and in doing so, he identified with you and with me in our need of cleansing and forgiveness of sin. In Paul's great hymn found in the book of Philippians, we read, and being found in appearance as a human being, Emmanuel humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge, listen, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let me wrap it up this way wise people of every age still seek him. Wise people 
will overcome their resistance to him because of his love, his grace, his meekness, and his lowliness of heart. Wise people will find in him the rest that only he can bring to our lives, to our souls. Wise people of every age will continue to offer worthy worship to God through Emmanuel. Wise people will honor him by the way they live their lives, inspired by the majesty of his humility. Wise people will place their ultimate trust in the one who has been born king of the Jews. Why? Because, friends, listen, his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and it will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now, there is one thing that we can know for certain from this passage, and it's this. He has come. And because he has come, friends, he will come again. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the humility of Emmanuel. And we pray that we may open our hearts and lives to him and find life that he has come to give and live it to the blessing of people and the glory of your name.